This is what the choir sees every Sunday. So I want to tell you how much I appreciate you and appreciate your leadership, your singing. That was a beautiful song. And thank you for leading us in worship. Thank you, Pastor Angie. Always does a great job. Our musicians, all who lead us in worship. And so uh, really appreciate them. Appreciate you too. It's, uh, we're coming down to uh, the end. So we have today. And then we have next Sunday. It's our last Sunday. And so uh, we're, we're kind of sad, really, but we're kind of excited also for all that God has in store. I express my appreciation. I'll do this probably again next week. But to each of you, we've had a wonderful, wonderful, um, it's just been our privilege to be here to serve Christ together. Um, the laughter, the singing, we love to hear the church sing. And our staff has been great. Um, and Thea, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bennett, uh, Pastor Phil, um, Pastor Angie, all of our staff, our staff upstairs, and all of our caretakers. It's just been a great place to serve. Our deacons, we're so thankful. Our lives, I was saying to uh, Judy the other day, my life would be incomplete without being in Hong Kong. I just really appreciate the privilege of being here. Today I want to preach to you one of those necessary sermons. As we have the excitement of a new pastor coming, which I believe will be in town later in the week, Dr. Tanner and his wife Carol. And as we think about a new pastor coming, one of those necessary sermons, what does every pastor need? So take your Bibles and turn, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. What does every pastor need? When God called me to preach, I was not exactly sure what I was getting into. In fact, when God called me to preach, I was 17 years of age. If truth be told, when I was in fourth grade, I invited Jesus Christ into my heart. I believe when I came to know Christ, I, this is very unusual, I believe I knew I was called to preach in fourth grade. I am told that my grandmother, who lived in the mountains of North Carolina, prayed when I was born. She held my hand and she prayed that I would either be a preacher or a lawyer. <laughs> and so I became a preacher. At 17 years of age, I surrendered to God's call. The first church that I pastored, I was 19 years of age. I was at Howard Payne University. I was 19 years of age, and every Saturday I would go out and visit my people. I pastored the Locker Baptist Church out in the middle of nowhere in Texas. All I had was farmers and ranchers. Every Sunday morning, the same 12 people showed up for church. But one Sunday, 28 people showed up when the Boy Scouts showed up. That was a day to call home about and tell my parents, we had 28 people in church today. The preaching must be getting better. <laughs> in Texas, we didn't have air conditioning. In that little church, and so on a hot summer day, especially when it was really, really hot during the peanut farming uh, harvest season, you could see old Merle Taylor. He had a unique ability to set his Bible right there and to go right to sleep. Good preaching, I've said before, is like a good anesthesiologist. It can put you right to sleep. On Saturday, I would go visit my church members, Earl and Emma Parks. Emma would always have a nice piece of pecan pie for me. I would always, before I made it back to the little town where I lived and went to university, I, I, I would always go by and visit my good farmer, Merle Taylor. Knocked on the door one day on a Saturday, and um, Mrs. Taylor came to the door, and I said, I'm here to visit Merle. And she said, as only you can say in Texas, he's out back. Went out back, and he was there working with his animals. While he was working with his animals, I'm the boy who grew up in the city, the young man called to preach, 19 years of age, always searching for the right words for my congregation. I said to Merle Taylor that day, the farmer, I like your sheep. 
And he said, as only you can say in Texas, Preacher, them's goats. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I understood Jesus talking about the sheep and the goats. And sometimes it's a little hard to tell the difference. But I love being a pastor. I love visiting the people. I love preaching. I love the ministry. Back in those days, Pastor Angie, I taught the Bible study class of 12. I also led the church in singing. And one Sunday, um, almost every Sunday, we would sing, Make Me a Channel of Blessing, as Emma Parks would play that song. And I never really understood what I was getting into when I was called to be a pastor, but I loved it. And then several years later, I went to another church and really struggled in my first several years. I remember in those early years at Lakeside Baptist Church, someone came to my house and I was getting a blood test. I was getting life insurance. And so while I was getting life insurance, you know what they have to do. They have to take blood. They came to our house. I sat down, in the, I sat down at a table and the lady, she's like, give me your arm. I'm like, okay, there's my arm. I don't like needles. She said, it's going to be okay. It'll only hurt for a minute. Ha, 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 ha. She sticks the needle in. I'm gritting my teeth. And she says so beautifully, you know that pastors are one of the highest health risks. And I didn't say anything, but I wanted to say, well, thanks a lot. Get the needle out of my arm. <laughs> Pastoring is not always an easy job. I never knew what I was getting into, but having pastored for 35 years and now being an interim pastor for the last several years, I can say that there are great joys in pastoring, there are great challenges in pastoring, there are days when you are on top of the world, there are days when you feel like you're on the bottom of the barrel. There are days when you celebrate with joy all that God is doing. And there are days when you agonize in prayer and sometimes in struggle because you're not sure God is doing anything. And being a pastor is a very unique call. I would say to you quite honestly, and I'm going to be very honest in today's sermon today as I usually am, uh, you, you, don't, you don't understand what it means to be a pastor unless you've been a pastor. Because a pastor's job is 24 hours, 7 days a week. Just like today, when I finish today's sermon, I'll get home and I'll take a nap. And after I take a nap, I'll start thinking about next Sunday, I'll put this sermon away. And sometimes I throw sermons away. I'll put this sermon away. And before tonight, before the sun goes down, I'll start working on next Sunday's sermon. And there's always one more thing to do, one more hospital visit, one more meeting, one more email. There's always one more thing to do in the life of a pastor. And while I love being a pastor, I love everything about it, I can tell you honestly there are some days that are really long and some days that are really hard. No one understands what it means to be a pastor unless you've been a pastor. So today I want to give you one of those necessary sermons. What your pastor needs. As Dr. Tanner and his wife Carol come, what does your pastor need from you? What can you do for your pastor under God's glory, under the under-shepherding care of Christ? And so today I want to talk to you about that as we look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, and I want us to read um, these verses through verse 4, where Paul gives us a very clear word, a command to shepherd the flock. This is what the pastor does. In verse 1, he says, To the elders among you, I exhort, I encourage you, I call the Spirit of God alongside to help, is, is the kind of the gist of what he's saying. I, who am a fellow elder, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and the one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. We're going to review this again in the end. The glory to be revealed. Peter is always speaking of God's glory yet to be revealed. He speaks of the glory. God's light is power. Verse 2. 
Be shepherds of the flock. I like the way another translation, it gives it a little bit more of a, a punch, a little bit more of a command as it is, shepherd the flock of God, he says. Shepherd the flock that is among you under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Interesting, because the language is not tight-fisted, but open-handed, with an open heart, willing to serve, to give your very life. Verse 3. Nor is being lords over those, not lording it over those entrusted to you. Um, It's a very strange term to understand, but it's actually kind of a Greco-Roman idea where the emperor, maybe the Roman army, they would lord it over, they would force everything with power and control. He says, no, not lording it over, the shepherd under God's care, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being a tupas, an example to the flock. Verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So what do we think of when we think of a pastor? Maybe you think of a person standing in a pulpit. Maybe you think of a person doing a wedding. Maybe you think of someone doing a funeral. Maybe you think of someone that you call and you talk to about a crisis or someone to pray for you. Maybe we think, as we did in the earlier service this morning, someone in the baptistry waters in a white robe baptizing. Maybe you think of someone who is preparing sermons. Maybe you think of someone who's with the people. Maybe you think of someone sharing a meal. How do you think of a pastor? If we look at this text, I think what we begin to see is that the pastor has three roles. And I don't want to get too much into the technicality of these words, but what we see is the three roles of a pastor. The first one, he uses the phrase fellow elder or elder. It's the word from which we get our English word presbyter or maybe even Presbyterian at its root. And the idea is that one role of a pastor is that the role of a pastor is such that that pastor has practical leadership and spiritual wisdom. John Maxwell says that leadership is influence. A pastor uses his influence to the glory of God. A pastor uses influence to proclaim God's goodness, his grace, his strength, his forgiveness, his love, his power. A pastor uses influence to speak about faith in Jesus Christ. But also we see in this term a sense of wisdom, a sense of forward-looking. A pastor's always looking forward as a fellow elder, looking forward not only to what God can do, but leading people to where God wants them to be. I like what Henry Nouwen says when he speaks of the pastor and speaks of leadership. The leadership of the future, he says, is not a leadership of power and control, but a leadership of powerlessness and humility in which the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, is made manifest. In other words, the pastor's role is the presbyter to preach the gospel, to declare the gospel, to declare the wisdom of God, to lead people to the wisdom of God. As such, we know that sometimes in, as a pastor, there are the joys of pastoring. There are also sometimes the burdens of leadership. Some of the things that the burden, the pastor carries the burden of the church. Even sometimes the burdens of other people's lives. But at its root, it's a presbyter, a fellow elder, someone who displays and dispenses a practical kind of wisdom. But the second term we see is not elder, but the second term we see is a little bit different. The word you see in verse 2, shepherd. The pastor has a nurturing and caring role. Not only is the pastor a leader, practical wisdom, but a nurturing and caring role. Kind of like Merle Taylor on the farm would take care of his goats and would take care of his sheep. One day on Sunday morning, he was telling me while we were standing before church and talking, he had been out all morning. He said, Pastor, you know, the goats and sheep are very much alike. He said, this morning, one goat found a hole in the fence and all the goats got out on the highway, had to take my truck and trailer and gather up the goats, repair and patch the fence and take them back. And he would teach me about farming and he would talk about the importance of faith in farming. You have to trust God. 
And in the midst of it all, he was always taking care of his sheep and goats and his cows. He was always taking care of his fields and farm. He was always taking care of his family. And he always took care of his faith. He loved the Lord. Even though some Sundays he would sit there with his Bible propped up sleeping. He loved the Lord with all of his heart. A pastor has a nurturing role. I like the idea as an under-shepherd, under the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, that a pastor is a shepherd. Sometimes he will lead you beside still waters. Sometimes the pastor will help restore your soul. Sometimes the pastor will challenge you. And sometimes the pastor will preach on sin so that God's Spirit can convict, help you get back on the right track. Sometimes the pastor will be the one who will comfort you in a crisis. It's part of the pastor's role, the shepherding, nurturing role. But the third role of a pastor is that of a bishop of an, or an overseer. The pastor not only has a leadership of spiritual leadership, the pastor not only has a spiritual care and nurture, the pastor also has a role of administration. Now church, there's a lot to do. What you see on Sunday, our staff works very hard. What you see happening on Sunday is not all that takes place. Every week there are so many administrative things. A pastor will also work with other churches or such as this summer we have a group coming from the states to work with Vacation Bible School to administrate those kind of things. To administrate certain aspects of the church, financial or practical, finding leaders. There are so many things to do. And as an overseer, a pastor has oversight. This means partly he has responsibility, but it also means that deep in his heart, he wants the church to reveal God's glory, wants the church to proclaim God's glory, and wants the church to honor Christ. I've never met a pastor who did not want the church to grow, who didn't want people to grow. And so that's part of the oversight. But if we look through the windows of the church, the stained glass windows of the church, what we began to see is shepherd the flock of God. He begins to tell us about a pastor in verse 2 where he says the pastor um, is not someone who indeed is serving, he's an overseer, but he lives not by compulsion but willingly. In other words, this is what a pastor does. A pastor is not compelled by humans but called by God. This is something that's very difficult sometimes for people to understand. When we were talking about coming to Hong Kong, we had talked to the pastor search committee via Skype and Judy and I were praying and, and we were talking about, you know, what does God have, what would God want us to do? We committed to come and it was kind of fun. A year ago, we sold our house because uh, we needed to sell our house and then... Um, We didn't need a house that big, and so we were living in a rent house before we moved here. We put all of our stuff in storage. We started telling people that we were going to be moving. Privately, we kind of laughed and chuckled a little bit at the responses of people, because when we said we're going to be moving, people would say, well, where are you moving to? And we would say, Hong Kong. And the responses were interesting. Hong Kong. Why would you want to go to Hong Kong? Oh, don't go to Hong Kong. Oh, I went to Hong Kong once. You don't want to go to Hong Kong. Why can't you just serve a church here in Texas? Hong Kong? But God called us here. We're so thankful that God called us here. The call of God is the greatest One of the deepest, most spiritual things that you experience. Truthfully, if we read all of Peter or all of Paul's letters, what Paul and Peter would say together is God calls everyone. First, He calls us to follow Him, an invitation to follow Christ. Secondly, He calls us to serve Him. Sometimes He gives a unique call. He calls some to teach, some to maybe work with children or young people. He calls some to lead worship. He calls all of us to serve Him regardless. He calls some to pastor, to preach. It's a wonderful blessing, but it's not something that everybody understands. And yet here, what He says is the pastor, He's not compelled by human beings. In my lifetime as a pastor, I've had people who wanted me to do something that I didn't feel called to do. I couldn't do it. 
I've had others who didn't want me to do something, but I felt called to do it, and I had to do it. There have been joyous times when God called others and God called me to do things together. And so out of that, uh, you can't, as a pastor, cannot always be compelled by human thinking. He is called by God to follow God first and foremost, the good shepherd, the under shepherd who follows the good shepherd, but also a pastor is not seeking to gain, but willing to serve. I said earlier, he's not tight-fisted, always trying to get money, money, money. I had a man tell me years ago, you know, pastors, they always preach on money. Truthfully, Jesus talked about money more than almost any single thing. Because money can wrap itself around our hearts, and sometimes we can be tight-fisted with our money, and sometimes even pastors can be after money. But here Peter says, a pastor is not supposed to be tight-fisted or grabbing money, but a pastor should be willing to serve. And the language is powerful because if we get all the way down to verses 6 and 7, Peter begins to talk about the humility of Christ. He begins to talk about how we humble ourselves and the pastor is to humble himself before Christ and we humble ourselves together before Christ. And so what we do is we become open-handed, open-hearted people who are blessed by God, who give our hearts and lives and even our resources to the glory of God. We as ministers are not seeking to gain, not personal gain, but we are willing to serve. We're not ruling by force, but tupas. We're setting an example. The idea is there's an ink pad over here and there's a rubber stamp and, and this is Christ is the model. And so you put it in the ink pad and you stamp it over here and this over here looks exactly like the stamp over here. And Christ is the model and so Christ's stamp is on our lives. And what Peter is saying is we're to imitate Christ. The greatest thing you can do for your pastor is to imitate and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the pastor's not ruling by force and control like the Roman army or the Roman emperor, but the pastor with an open heart, a shepherd's heart, is setting an example. So what are some practical things that you can do for your pastor? What does your pastor need from you? Here are eight things your pastor needs you to do. Here's the first one. Your pastor needs you to pray. Your pastor needs you to pray for God's glory to be revealed. Your pastor needs you to pray for the church, for him, for his wife Carol. Your pastor needs you to pray for the church, for the staff. Your pastor needs you to pray that people will come to Christ. Your pastor needs you to pray for your family, your lost, church mem- your lost family members, to also pray for church members that you know. Your pastor needs you to pray that God will do His work in your life and in the church. Your pastor needs you to pray. John Henry Newman says that prayer is where heart speaks to heart. In prayer, your heart pours out and speaks to God's heart, and God's heart begins to speak to you. And out of that, what your pastor needs is he needs a praying church. He needs a church that will pray for him. He needs a church that will pray for his family. He needs a church that in his very long days, when he feels weak, will pray to God for strength. He needs you to pray for God's grace at work in his life and in the life of the church. That's one thing your pastor needs. A second thing, pastor needs your love. Now, I don't want you to walk up to Pastor Dr. Tanner next Sunday when he's here and I'll be preaching my last sermon, I don't want you to walk up to him and repeat what I'm getting ready to tell you, but I want to give you some insider information. Most pastors go into the ministry and are a little insecure. Don't walk up to Dr. Tanner. Well, Pastor John said that most pastors are insecure. (laughs) Are you insecure? We don't advertise it. Then when you go to a new church, there are two kinds of experience. I may have 35 years of pastoral experience, but when I go to a new church, you have to learn the church all over. And so what a pastor needs is a pastor needs for you to love the pastor. 
And so if we reason through this, if the pastor loves Jesus and Jesus loves the pastor, then the pastor loves Jesus and Jesus loves you, and you love the pastor, and Jesus loves the church, then you should love the pastor. I would repeat that, but I don't think I could. <laughs> love the pastor, because the pastor loves Jesus, and Jesus loves you. Third thing the pastor needs, he needs your care. Sometimes the pastor hurts. When Pastor Harry was here, his brother passed away. His mother. You did a wonderful job of caring for the pastor. Sometimes pastors hurt because they don't know what to do. There might be an occasion where a pastor comes from a foreign land to Hong Kong and the pastor may feel a little lonely. The pastor may have a deep sense of hurt, might not advertise it. So your nurturing care, your shepherding care for the under-shepherd is very important. And sometimes you don't always know what's going on in the church or what's going on in the pastor's life. So to be sensitive, as Christ was sensitive, to demonstrate compassion or maybe to withhold a word when you're just not sure everything that's going on. Wisdom, this is the kind of care the pastor needs. Fourth thing, the pastor needs encouragement. Do you remember the stories I've told you? By the way, I'm okay with saying this. You will not remember any sermon I preached. I doubt very seriously that by the time you get to work on Monday morning, you're going to remember much about this sermon. But preaching is kind of like eating. You might not remember what you ate for lunch yesterday, but you need to eat. You might not remember what I preached on last Sunday, but you need preaching. I need preaching. Your pastor needs encouragement. You won't remember my sermons, but you might remember my stories. Remember when I told you about old John Waters? He was the guy who took me fishing. I preached, uh, I think in my third week, about told you the story about John Waters. I think I told you that I, we were out there fishing and it started raining. But John Waters was a little man who stood at the door every Sunday. Even if I preached really bad and said, Good sermon, preacher. Some Sundays a preacher needs a good sermon, preacher. Remember the story about Dorothy Han? She was my neighbor. I described her as a wonderful lady, Mrs. Han. Our girls went over and played with her. She lived next door and she painted their fingernails. I described her driving an automobile like the wild chariot driver Jehu in the Bible. Remember Dorothy Han? She was the lady who stood in front of the church when I was struggling as a very young pastor and the church was struggling and she held my hands and she looked at me and she said, now don't you worry, God is going to do great things through your life and God is going to do great things through this church and she encouraged me when I was very discouraged. Pastors need encouragement. Remember the story that I told you just a couple of weeks ago of Elaine Smith, the lady who called me little boy who sent me cards, more cards than anybody that I've ever known in ministry. Send the pastor a happy Father's Day card. Happy Father's Day, all fathers. Happy birthday, pastor. Happy 40 years in the ministry, pastor. Welcome to Hong Kong, pastor. We'll take you to eat chicken feet. Encouragement. Pastors need encouragement. One of the reasons pastors need encouragement is because they encourage so much. Sometimes their encourager is given out and your encouragement will energize them like putting gas in the car to encourage you even more. They need encouragement. Fifth thing. You knew I'd get around to it. Pastors need you to give. There have been three times in my life that I was really worried about money. One was personally, when I first went into the ministry, there were some days, quite frankly, I was not even sure how we were going to pay our bills. But God came through. Two times as a pastor, 
I was not sure how God was going to meet the needs of the church. We were in serious financial crises. But God always came through. Church, there's so much for this church to do. And I want to begin this part of the sermon by praising you. This is a giving church. You are such a great and giving church. Maybe some of you have the ability in the future to give more. There's a lot to do. The building, invest for eternity. Maybe some of you need to learn to tithe. Maybe some of you aren't giving anything. This would be a challenge to give to the Lord's work. Maybe some of you, God has just poured out the windows of heaven and blessed you so much you can never give away all the money you have. Maybe God would call you. Maybe God's gifted you to give in special ways. And so sometimes I will tell you, pastors worry about money in the church. I will be honest and tell you, when I was a young pastor, I worried about it. I worried about it so much, one day I realized that the Bible says not to worry. Preachers have to preach to themselves sometimes. And then another day I realized it does absolutely no good to worry about money because sometimes there's almost nothing I can do about it anyway. I can't control the economy. I can't control what people give. I had to learn to trust the Lord. But some pastors worry about money. And so don't put the pastor in a position where the pastor has to worry about money. Give. But don't give to the pastor. Don't even give to the church. Give to the Lord through the church to honor the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. And I would find ways to give to minister to people. This church is very good. It has good checks and balances. Our leadership, our finance committee, they do a great job of managing the finances of the church with wisdom. You can be confident that when you give, this church does missions around the world. This church takes care of its staff. This church is wise with the Lord's money and you can give. Sixth thing. When the pastor does something you do not like, And it will happen. Turn back to God's call. That God called your pastor to the church. You know, sometimes as pastors, we say things and do things. I've stood in the pulpit one Sunday and said something. I couldn't even believe later I said it. And then the next Sunday, I stood in the pulpit and apologized to the church for saying it. I've done some things that, um, as a pastor... I was like, I, you know, I, I, I shouldn't have treated that person that way. And, and I have to ask the Lord to forgive me and apologize to the person. We're human beings. I've had agonizing days in ministry where I'm like, Lord, you know, I shouldn't be agonizing like this because I'm a called minister of God. I've had days when people were upset with me about something. I've had people upset with me for preaching the gospel. I've had people upset with me from time to time for decisions that the church made. They were upset with me. And it's not always easy. But what I have to do is look to God's call. And what you need to do, if the pastor does something you don't like, you have to look to God's call on that person's life and your life. Forgiveness is important even in the church. I'll also tell you something else about pastors. This morning in the earlier service when I started preaching, I said turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, and I said when Paul wrote these words. And I knew the moment I said it that Paul didn't write 1 Peter. What will happen is preachers will go home and they will think about what they preached And as I said earlier, before the day is over, I'll be getting ready to preach next Sunday. And some sermons will go in the trash. And some sermons I might save to rework later on. But we know when we messed up. And sometimes pastors are hard on themselves. And so, understand the pastor's call by God, the under-shepherd, under the good shepherd's care. Seventh thing. Rejoice in the Lord. One of the things I love about this church, we talk about this during the week, is I love to hear the church sing. First service, second service, doesn't matter. 
I mean, what we should just say is, you are the choir. We should put the choir out here and have one choir one Sunday. You sing so beautifully. To me, that's a sign of the joy of Christ. Make sure that you share that joy during the week at home. You live that joy in the community. Make sure you bring that joy with a prepared heart to worship. Make sure you sing and live that joy before Christ. Make sure that you deliver that joy here at church and at home. Make sure that you live that joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Paul said to the church at Philippi, rejoice in the Lord always. This is what your pastor needs. He needs you to find the joy of Christ. In the crises of life, he needs you to understand the circumstances are not good, but you still have the joy and hope of Christ. When the pastor says in the, in the crises, in the shadow of death, we still have hope. We do not grieve as those who have no hope. We need to be reminded of the, the joy of Christ's hope. And so... Bring the joy of Christ each Sunday to church, as you often do. And then finally, be unified in a pursuit, in the quest, in pursuit of an unfading crown of glory. Listen to what he says. Two times Peter uses the word glory. One time in the future, and we should think about this more as Christians, we should think about this more as followers of Christ, the glory yet to be revealed. The one day will be with heaven in Christ's glory in its fullness, in its light, in its power, in its wisdom, in its strength, in the fullness of Christ's forgiveness, in the wonder of His grace. Everything we could ever sing about, we'll realize it. We should think about as a church and also as Christians, the glory yet to be revealed. I think we should think about the glory yet to be revealed in our own lives. We should have a sense that God is at work and that God's Spirit is at work in fresh and new ways. God has taught me this during this time in Hong Kong. The Spirit of God at work in fresh and new ways. His glory yet to be revealed. God is at work. He's going to do new things, fresh things. second time you use the word glory is you see there in verse 4. And there in verse 4, he says, when the chief shepherd, I like the good shepherd in John, now the chief shepherd shall appear. You will receive, you shall obtain, you shall carry, you'll hold in your hand, maybe is the idea. You will obtain the crown of glory, this um, symbol of a garland crown, except in the ancient day, athletes would receive a crown, a garland crown. But this crown is a different kind of crown, a crown of glory that will never fade away. It will not fade, it will not die, it will not rust. And what he speaks of is that we're in a unified quest and pursuit of God's glory and in a unified quest a pursuit of the unfading crown. It's very simple. If we're all pursuing Christ's glory and all seeking the unfading crown and we're all loving Jesus with all of our heart and soul and mind and loving our neighbors as ourselves, this helps the pastor. But more importantly, it builds God's kingdom. And ultimately, we want to build God's kingdom. I think the crown, the whole sense of glory, means three things. One, glory is bound up in Christ. Two, glory is bound up in God's work in Christ through the cross, forgiveness, all the things that we could talk about, His grace, how good God is to us, His goodness. But glory is also bound up in a sense, I believe, of vision. That Christ has gone to prepare a place for us and maybe for a church and for a pastor. We have a vision of what God can do and you have a vision of God's work in your life. I remember as a pastor, um, we too were getting ready to build a building. We were going to relocate. We were looking for land and we had a contract on a piece of land. And one of my good friends, um, Preston Wright, he was in his 80s in those days. Preston Wright took me in front of the church and he, he, he said, Pastor, as he pointed, we're going to build the new church right there. I said, Preston, we can't build the church there. We've been on the land. It's not even buildable. And Preston, you know that the man who owns the land is not going to sell it to us. We'll never build a church there, Preston. He said, no, Pastor, we're going to build a church right there. On a Monday, we had a contract on a piece of land to sign at the bank on Tuesday. And on that Monday, we got a call at the church. 
And the man across the street who owned the land said, I want to sell the church the land. We canceled one contract and we bought that piece of land and we built the church what we called on the hill. We built the church on the land. Preston had a great sense of God's glory. He talked about heaven. Preston had a great sense of God's vision. I never will forget one of the last times I saw him. We went to eat chicken fried steak. Only in Texas do you eat chicken fried steak with white gravy poured all over it, mashed potatoes, and lots of bread, lots of carbs. And I never will forget when Preston showed up, he looked different. Because that day he stood on the hill, the wind was blowing, his big bush of hair was blowing in the wind. And the day at the restaurant was like, Preston, he was bald headed. Where's your hair? He said, well, preacher, I was driving. He had a little white truck, driving my little white truck down the road with a window down. And I looked to see if a car was coming. And there went my toupee. So I just decided, I'm going to be what I am. (laughs) No hair. But he had great vision. But finally... To understand this passage, you have to think of Jesus and the disciples at Galilee. You have to think of Jesus preparing fish for the disciples in his resurrection body. Only in Hong Kong, so wonderful, and only in Galilee will people eat fish for breakfast. But then the words, because Peter had denied Jesus three times. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. A second time, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. And you can almost hear Peter doing it a third time. Peter, do you love me? Jesus said. And a third time, Lord, come on. How many times do you need to ask? You know I love you. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Shepherd the flock of God. Your pastor needs you. Your pastor needs your prayer, your encouragement, all those other things that we talked about. And together, we need God's love. So the question is from Jesus, do you love me? I want you to bow your heads and hearts today in the spirit of prayer. Father, today we thank you for your love, we thank you for your grace, and today, Lord Jesus, we look to you. We commit ourselves as a body of Christ to you as Dr. Tanner, our new pastor, comes and his wife, Carol. We pray your blessing on their ministry. Lord, help us to be the kind of servants of Christ, the kind of followers of Christ. Help us, Lord, to look to you, the good shepherd. Help us, Lord, to love you with all of our hearts and souls and minds. And, Lord, today we rejoice together that you love us and that it's your love that brings us together to sing the praise of joy and to be reminded of the hope of Christ and the glory yet to be revealed. Now, Lord, speak to our hearts, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.